Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good to see so many of you flooding in at the back there. Do please try and take your seats. Uh, if any of you were expecting the World Timber Sports Championships, I'm afraid you're at the wrong end of a building. Um, and my name is James Walsh. I'm a member of the PLSA's policy team looking after engagement and EU issues. So uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this session, which is going to try and get behind the scenes of a Brexit drama that we see being played out on the news. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, that we have one of the country's most respected commentators and broadcasters, Andrew Marr, uh, to help us understand what's really going on. So no pressure there, uh, Andrew. Now, uh, you all know the drill by now. You can tweet about the session. Um, the hashtag might be appearing on the screen. If not, I think you all know by now it's hashtag PLSA annual. You can send in questions to me via the app and they'll appear magically on the iPad. Uh, or you can just raise your hand in the uh, old-fashioned and still perfectly effective way. Um, uh, great pleasure to welcome uh, Andrew. Needs barely any introduction uh, from me, although perhaps in the spirit of the random facts we heard about the speakers in the last session, uh, I should note that if we'd been here in Liverpool just a few weeks ago, I believe we could have popped out of the conference for a short time out down to the Cork Art Gallery. Cork Art Gallery in Sefton yes. Park, yes. Yeah. And you had an exhibition. A very fine exhibition of, of paintings. Fine exhibition myself. of Andrew's uh, paintings. Uh, but don't worry if you uh, missed that opportunity. For those of you who are going back to London, I believe Andrew has some of his work uh, on display and available for purchase uh, at the uh, second half centre for uh, the over 50s in North Kensington. I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but they've all gone. Oh, they've all gone. <laughs> Too good, too bad, too bad. Too late. And he was saying on his Twitter feed, Christmas is coming and a great cause, see you there. But uh, we missed that opportunity. Uh, any, Andrew, that is the commercial done. We're delighted to see you That's here me. in Liverpool. Over That's very you. nice of you, James. Thank Thanks you. very much indeed. Now, what I'm going to do is I get a rare opportunity, which I don't normally do on the show, to actually talk directly about what I think is going on. Now, you will appreciate... I'm a BBC loyalist, and what I can't do, therefore, is make party political points or suggest how I would have voted or anything like that. But I hope I can bring a bit of clarity to what is a very, very complicated and fast-moving situation, and at the very, very least, help you all to think slightly more clearly about it. Next time you see Laura Koonsberg or whoever it might be on the telly going on about Brexit, not that she goes on, but... Um, <laughs> So what I thought I'd do is talk for about half an hour or so about what's happening now and behind the scenes and so on. And then there's 15 minutes for questions. And I should emphasize, I'm going to talk about Brexit, obviously, but I'll talk about some other things as well. And when it comes to questions, in the spirit of the Andrew Marr Show on a Sunday morning, ask me anything you like. I may not answer you in the spirit of the Andrew Marr Show, but you can ask. Um, let me start, therefore, with the events overnight, yesterday and overnight where I think uh, Theresa May may have made a very serious tactical mistake or error. Now, the Prime Minister this morning is hanging by a thread. Now, she's been hanging by the same thread for quite a long time. She's beginning to feel quite uh, warm and comfortable about her thread. She knows it well. It knows her well. Um, she, f she, feel she feels, as I say, uh, enthusiastic almost about the thread by which she is hanging, but, ladies and gentlemen, it is fraying by the second. Now, why is it fraying by the second? Because she has come up with a new idea about how to resolve this endlessly difficult conundrum, what the EU has itself called a Gordian knot to try and get us out of the EU securely and successfully. Um, and she says we should carry on for, she originally suggested, it could be several years beyond where we are, the tr a transition period ending just before the next scheduled general election in 2022, but certainly a transition period longer than the current 18 months. Why does this really matter? Because during the transition period, we will be, in the, e e uh, the European Commission's own words, rule takers, not rule makers. We'll be under the EU, under its legal system. We will be paying money in with no say about what's going to happen. We would be in a state of what many Tory MPs have described as vassalage. We'd be a vassal state of the EU at the moment for 18 months. Now, if that goes on for another two years, that's really significant because that's another two years. Quite good for business, quite good for a lot of investors, perhaps, because there is semi-certainty, at least about the short term, 
during that period. On the other hand, um, the new European budget round starts in 2020-21. Therefore, we would have to pay in a lot more money. We'd have no say about how much money we were paying in to the EU coffers or what it was for. It would be a very, very uncomfortable position to be in. That's why so many Tory MPs, whether they're Remainers or Leavers, are deeply unhappy about the idea of an extended transitional period. It sounds terribly technical. What it means is being bound hand and foot for another two years or so by the EU before we properly leave. The second problem with it, of course, is that once we are paying the money in, once we are agreeing to abide by their rules, how much priority does the EU have to give us a really great trade deal? What's our leverage? We have no leverage. We're paying our money in. We've agreed to be bound by their rules. We have no leverage. So the idea that this allows us to get a better long-term relationship with the EU, a better free trade deal, seems to many people completely delusional. But there is a third problem, which come, brings me back to the Prime Minister, our poor, unhappy Prime Minister. Nobody has had a worse uh, goblet of hemlock to drink as Prime Minister, and yet I suppose nobody has reached for the goblet of hemlock more enthusiastically than Theresa May did at the start of all of this. Um, well, the reason I think that she has made potentially a really serious strategic mistake is that her big argument against Tory MPs plotting to remove her, and that's most of the time what Tory MPs spend their time doing, of course, um, that's what they're elected to do, is to get rid of their leader on a regular basis by <laughs> plot and murder. Um, <laughs> Her main argument against them up to now has been, but we're right at the end, we're at the crucial point of this very, very difficult negotiation, a historic negotiation for the, for the, for the UK about withdrawing from the EU. This is a really, really, you don't really want to get rid of the Prime Minister now. I'm in the middle of this thing. It would be disastrous for the party, for the country. It would never be forgiven. And now she's saying, and by the way, this might be the case for another couple of years, or maybe three years. And they look at her and they think, another three years of this? Really? That is why this is a particularly perilous moment for Theresa May right now. Watch for the choreography of a well-known uh, Brexiteering minister or ex-minister appearing in Smith Square or somewhere central uh, around Westminster with half a dozen senior Tories, some of them serving ministers, standing behind him, almost certainly a him, possibly a her, might, might be Penny Morden, but you know, probably David Davis or something like that, and saying, this is not about removing the Prime Minister, but we have formed the reluctant conclusion that Theresa May is no longer able to take us through these very difficult negotiations. She's a patriotic, decent woman, and she's done her level best, but we're terribly sorry. We don't think that she can take us through the next phase. And so this is nothing to do with me. I don't want to be a prime minister, whoever, whoever it is. Has it. Nothing to do with me at all, but unfortunately, for the sake of the country, we have to have a change of leadership. Now, we're not very far away from this situation, I think. Um, she has survived many scrapes before. She's a tough dogged woman who hangs on tightly to power and will carry on doing so. But I just get the sense that at the moment, people from both wings of the party, both the Brexiteers and the Remainers, are spending a lot of time slowly prizing her hands, knuckle by knuckle, off that thread. So that's the first cheerful thought to think about. <laughs> um, I'd like to um, take a few steps back, however, and try to uh, discuss with you why we are in this very difficult position in the first place. Um, and go and try and do it without too much jargon, because I do think one of the problems we have is the jargon around Irish backstops and a backstop to the backstop and stuff is turning off so much of the country. And people shouldn't turn off, because these are actually entirely explicable and important issues which we can all understand. Um, I spend a lot of my time, and I'm not uh, interviewing politicians and being impertinent to them on a Sunday morning, uh, doing history, either reading history or writing history or making programs about history. And I'm a great believer that historical perspective really, really helps. So in that context, let's think about which is the most powerful still, most powerful and important voice in the EU. And the answer to that is Germany. And let's last ask ourselves how Germany happened, how Germany came about as a single state. And one answer is war, and that is certainly part of the story, the Austro-Hungarian War uh, and so forth, uh, the Austro-Prussian War, I beg your pardon, and the, uh, the, the Franco-Prussian Wars and so on. But the crucial thing that brought Germany together was the Zollverein, 
the single tariff wall around all those tiny little German states and princelings and margrave ships and free cities that constituted pre-Germany Germany. So they, they, they drew a huge customs ring around it, and they said, inside this ring, same weights and measures, um, everybody can trade freely with everybody else, and we protect the outside of the ring. And the outside of the ring came to define what we now call Germany. That is a very important sort of fundamental experience for the Europeans. Uh, they all looked to Germany, they understand how Germany was formed, and then after the war they thought of the Zoll of Rhine and thought, we will do the same thing with the rest of Europe. We will draw an enormous border around Europe. Inside that border, bit by bit, we will have free trade. One of the people who really brought free trade, of course, to the EU, one of the great proponents of the EU was Margaret Thatcher, a historical irony if ever there was one. But nonetheless, they, they draw this big ring around it. They say, here is our customs union border. And that is inviolable. That is what defines us. That is what defines modern Europe. That's the shape of us. And then you ask the question, so what happens if there is a great big hole in that, in that customs border? For them, that is as existential as the future of the UK is for us. It is a question that cannot even be raised or breached. Now, Northern Ireland um, is not a very, very big territory. It's an important territory, it's not a very big territory, but in terms of a hole in the customs union, it's an enormous, sodding, great hole. Once the UK leaves the EU, the question that all ministers should be asked, and I will try to remember to ask it on Sunday if I, if I don't forget, is sh do you accept that given that the EU is defined by a customs border around it, there should be, uh, it's acceptable to have a hole in that border? And if they think about it, they'll say, no, of course you can't have a hole in a customs border. A customs border is a customs border. And by the way, it's a hole through which people could uh, move freely from, from the UK to the EU and vice versa as well. So it is a problem. It's a huge... And, and, and so if you accept that, that there must be a border going forward between the UK and the European Union once we've left, the next question is, where should that border be? And there are two answers. Either you can say the border should be on the island of Ireland between the Republic and Northern Ireland. And if you say that, then you are breaching the, um, the, the very, very important Anglo-Irish Treaty and the entire Good Friday process, and you are bringing forward the possibility of shootings and murders and deaths around the border. Serious thing to be doing. Or you can say, well, it can't be there, and therefore, as the EU says, it must be down the Irish Sea. Now, Theresa May has said that no British Prime Minister could ever accept that. That would, in effect, divide the UK. Um, it would divide Great Britain from Northern Ireland and therefore cut a wedge down the UK. And bit by bit, Northern Ireland would become part of the Republic of Ireland. It would be part of the same system, the same economic system, and the border would melt away. And in a generation's time, Northern Ireland wouldn't really be British at all. And that's why she couldn't accept it. And there is a certain amount of merit in that argument as well. At the moment, the EU is saying behind the scenes, listen, don't worry about that. It's not really a border. You won't have great big barbed wire and guys with peaked hats and so forth. All it means is checking customs arrangements, checking the details of farm produce, as we already do, um, looking at the origins of goods, as we already do. We can build some sheds around Liverpool. We'll be somewhere. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll stick some sheds on Merseyside. You'll barely notice it. It's not really an issue. What they call de-dramatizing the border. And that's fine up to a point. But the whole reason for us leaving the EU is, presumably, to make ourselves a different kind of country, to, to diverge from the EU model. And the more we diverge from the EU model, the more that border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland would be important. And therefore, the more significant it would be, and the more Northern Ireland would drift away from the rest of Great Britain, from the rest of the UK, and bit by bit by bit, it would become part of the Republic. So the choice is, do you have an agreement which brings back war to the island of Ireland, potentially? Or do you have an agreement which breaks up the UK? Which is it? That is the choice. That is, has been the choice all along. Theresa May knows it is an impossible choice. She can't choose either of those things. The Tory party, as it is currently constituted, can't choose either of those two things. Given that impossible choice, she has created this incredibly complex fudge called the Chequers Agreement, uh, which is now falling apart. 
Um, now, I completely understand why she is fudging, but it can't be fudged. And unlike on the Andrew Marr show, I think it's incumbent upon people like me to therefore suggest possible ways it could be dealt with. And I think there are two. Either she can take on the, um, the Irish nationalists and say, you don't really mean you're going to go back to the gun and the bomb just because there's a few checks on the Irish border. You don't really mean that. Um, and uh, actually puts a border back on, in, into Ireland. Uh, a lot of ministers, including in the Brexit department, have said you can make it a very, very soft border. You can have lots of technical checks. They can't quite explain when you ask them what those technical checks work, how they work, but they say they're there and they'll be there eventually. And you say, we're going to have the border in Ireland. We're terribly sorry. We know it breaks aspects of the Anglo-Irish agreement. We're terribly sorry about that. But in these new circumstances, we are going to take the risk and we're going to put a border back in Ireland. That's one answer. Uh, the other answer is for Theresa May to call in the DUP and say, I dare you, I dare you to pull me down if I put in a border on the Irish Sea. You people, if you pull me down, you know what's going to happen. You're going to get Jeremy Corbyn. He's more or less an IRA supporter. Are you really going to do that? I dare you. And by the way, if you choose to stick with me and not to bring me down, I've got five billion quid in my handbag and you can have it right now for any purpose you want. And frankly, probably that's what I would do. So there are two, but fra I'm afraid Theresa May is either too noble or too or lacking in courage to, to take either of those choices at the moment. And therefore, she is trying to kick the thing forward. Another two years of talking about this, which is why the Tory party is looking at her in great suspicion and saying, do you know what? We're not really ready for another two years of this. It is destroying us as a party. Let me talk about a couple of the other things that are absolutely central to the Brexit conversation at the moment. One is no deal. Now, everybody says again and again, it's the most boring thing you'll hear on television because everybody is saying nothing. We don't want no deal. There's not going to be. Nobody wants a no deal situation. There is going to be a deal. Nobody wants no deal. Nobody wants no deal. Nobody wants no deal. Just because nobody wants no deal doesn't mean there will be a deal. We could very well be faced with no deal and time is running out. And we know a little bit about what no deal might mean because we've had police reports warning of uh, civil disobedience and disturbances at the borders and down at the ports of the, the motorway system being jammed up with lorries, uh, if people exporting everything from foodstuffs to fish products to all sorts of things think that their businesses would go under within weeks. Uh, we know that for just-in-time manufacturing, for people like Range Rover and Nissan and other big companies, never mind Airbus, uh, a no deal would destroy their, their businesses very, very quickly. We're talking about tens of thousands of highly paid, highly skilled jobs on which our economy and your industry in part depends. So this would be a very, very serious situation. I think there are times in our national history as a country when politics becomes kind of immediate, personal and visceral, when you can feel it, when people talk to each other about it. The, the three-day week, Everyone who lived through it remembers whether or not they actually did, has the memory of lighting candles and uh, not going into work and how it is being cold. And then you've got the, 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 the winter of discontent and everybody remembers the, 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 the bodies not being buried in a, in, a, in a graveyard very close to where we're standing and the, the rubbish piling up in the streets and the rats and all the rest of it. There are moments of, as it were, social breakdown which go really deep into people's memories and they never forgive the politicians responsible for it. Now, I think a no-deal chaotic Brexit would be a moment like that. And I think the politicians in charge now, the current cabinet, would be regarded in the same way as Jim Callaghan and Michael Foote and the Labour Party were regarded after the winter of discontent, um, and Heath was regarded after the three-day week. In other words, it's a moment which is not forgiven or forgotten by the electorate for a very long time. It would be a really, really serious thing for the Tories to lead us through that. It doesn't mean they won't, because they haven't got an answer to the Irish problem, and they haven't got an answer to the even grander problem, which is what underlies all of this, which is where are we going as a country? Because Brexit was a kind of choice, but it was a first choice. It was saying, we're, gonna, we're going to leave the EU. It didn't tell us where we were going to go next. There is a complete logic to leaving the EU if you want us to be a less regulated, uh, less high tax, more, I don't know, Singaporean 
or Far Eastern kind of economy. A bit more like Florida, a bit more like Thailand, um, a, a bit wilder, you know, we, we create wealth a lot faster, we're not quite so good at distributing it around the place, we're a bit dirtier perhaps as a country, but we get on and do it. We're a rampaging, as it were, old-fashioned capitalist country. If you believe that's where we should be going, Brexit gives us a kick in the backside, which allows us to take a new direction. You know, our productivity growth has not been good recently. We have become sluggish and a bit idle and a bit too dependent on quite well-trained and affable um, people coming in from Eastern Europe to do the jobs we can no longer get out of bed in the morning to do ourselves. So if you believe we need to kick up the arse, then Brexit is what could give us. We could go in that direction. And the people who want us to go in that direction are, by and large, the people who talk about a Canada-style deal. In other words, we do quite a minimal deal with the EU. It allows... Uh, goods to carry on trading, a bit of this and that, but we basically say we are going to break with your system. We're not interested in EU regulations on health products or food or worker regulations, any of that stuff. It's all, it's all too much. It's too regulated. You go your way. We are going to go in a totally different direction. Now, if we do that, there will clearly be a big bump. Lots of current businesses and part of our current mis business model will go to pieces. And uh, that will be quite a shock. And I think if you're thinking about your uh, contributors in the short term, then um, they're going to have less money to spend on pensions and everything else. Um, I think government is going to have to raise taxes in, those, uh, in the short term to get us through that shock. But I think longer term, I'm, I'm relatively optimistic and bullish, longer term, we would find a way through. The chief economist of Deutsche Bank was asked on television quite recently about Brexit. He said, you know, the thing is, the British are actually quite hardworking, inventive, ingenious, and tough-minded. They will find a way through. I am not worried about Britain longer term um, after Brexit. And I feel more or less the same way. I think longer term, there's not, I mean, it's going to be a wild ride. Don't get me wrong. And the politics are going to get wilder as well. But there is a way through if we go in that direction. So that's direction A. Direction B is simply cleaving quite strongly to the European social democratic model staying quite close to the kind of country we are at the moment. And there's lots of attractions with that. We keep the big manufacturing companies. We keep the close relationship with Europe. We don't have to have visas when we go to visit France and all the rest of it. Um, the difficulty with that, of course, is that outside the legal systems of the EU, we would still have to pay them money and we would still have to um, at least mimic their regulations. A lot of Theresa May's thinking behind the Chequers compromise, so-called the common rule book, was that we would produce a common rule book on you know, lawnmower noise and uh, what can go into sausages, even in Liverpool, and all of that kind of stuff. And, um, and our rules would magically be the same as their rules. And of course, if they changed their rules, we would change our rules. So it was a way of um, accepting their rules, but retaining at least the vestige of national sovereignty and national decision-making. That, so, so that's the other way. So we can either stay more or less as we are, but no longer make the rules in the EU and carry on having to pay money, or we can take an entirely different direction. And I put it to you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, the Tory party and the cabinet cannot decide which of these big historic routes to take. And there is no middle way. Theresa May cannot straddle being partly a European social democratic country and partly an entirely different country, working to different sets of rules. So that is the big choice behind that. No deal is the biggest threat ahead of it for the Conservative Party. Um, and I hope I've explained why Theresa May is in deep, deep danger this morning uh, as Prime Minister. I think uh, you know, there's lots of questions which follow on from what I've said, but I want to raise a few other things as well, because I'm not even sure, I'm not even sure, ladies and gentlemen, that we should be talking too much about Brexit this morning, because I think there's some other really important things for your industry to think about. One of them, this is Theresa May on the phone, one of, them <laughs> is, one of them is taxation. Now, Theresa May said at the Tory party conference, um, I thought interestingly, perhaps unwisely, that austerity was over. What did she mean by that? Did she mean uh, the obvious common sense meaning that the cuts to local authorities, the cuts to uh, education, particularly to schools, um, the cuts to the business department, the cuts to the army, navy, and air force, all of those things would stop and we would return to the trend growth of spending. It's hard to see what she meant if she didn't mean that. 
But if she did mean that, then she's got two alternatives. Well, Philip Hammond now has two alternatives. He can raise, spe- uh, raise borrowing quite dramatically. He has said again and again and again, the pain we have all gone through is beginning to pay off and he will not go back to a higher rate of borrowing. He is determined to, to get the country's finances into order. I don't see how he could do that and remain as... I don't see how he could raise borrowing and re- remain as chancellor. So the only option is to raise taxes. And I think we are going to see... Uh, Monday after next, a tax-raising budget. Um, The question then, and this is very significant, I think, for your industry, is where taxes are going to be raised. Um, On the one hand, we've got a Conservative Party which has uh, one power again and again and again on the simple proposition that if you raise people's income tax, they don't vote for you. If you cut their income tax, by and large, they do. They They are neurologically sensitive to the question of income tax in particular. But they're also beginning to uh, eye up the the gross disparity in asset wealth in this country. If you uh, have the good luck to be born in London or the Southeast to middle-class parents, then the likelihood is that at some point in life you will inherit a property worth several million pounds. For the rest of the country, this is beyond dreaming. This is absolute fantasy. And therefore, there is a great disparity in in the families who have accumulated assets and those who have no assets and no way of protecting themselves against the the, the coming disruptions in the job market, about which I'll talk very briefly as well. Um, And so the taxation of assets is the new big thing in Whitehall. That's what lots of people are thinking about. Ways to tax property, not necessarily when somebody dies, because that's That's bumpy and hard to to smooth out from the Treasury's point of view, but possibly some kind of property tax going forward um, on properties of a million or two million pounds, some percentage extra taxation. It's not impossible. They do it in New York. They do it in many places around the world. It could be done here. It would be politically extremely controversial, and I don't think we'll see it in the budget or anything like that, but I think it's one of the things that somebody is going to grab. And if it's not Philip Hammond, it's going to be John McDonnell. Let me talk a little bit about the Labour Party. Uh, They had their conference here not so long ago in this very, if not in this, I think it was in this very room, certainly in this very building. Um, I am told, going around Whitehall and making trouble as I do, by lots and lots of very, very clever, very shrewd, plugged-in intellectual people, that Jeremy Corbyn will never be elected Prime Minister of Britain, that his views on... Uh, anti-Semitism and on the IRA and stuff is completely impossible. And I listen politely and I nod and I thank them. And then when I'm tottering off again, I remember that these are exactly the same, very, very well connected, very bright, very tuned in people who told me that it was absolutely certain that Remain would win the 2016 European referendum. I think it is perfectly possible that Labour will, will win the next election. And if if that happens, the person more responsible than any other, the guy who is the real leader of the Labour Party behind the scenes is John McDonnell, the Shadow Chancellor, possibly the most formidable Labour politician we have seen since Neil Kinnock. I'm not including Tony Blair and Gordon Brown in the Labour politicians in that case, am I? (laughs) They're new Labour, Um, uh, left Labour politician. Um, McDonnell is a real force inside the party, and he's thinking very, very hard about radically reshaping the entire economic system. And he's very close to getting there. I mean, if the Conservatives carry on like this, they will be smashed in the next general election, whether it comes early or whether it comes in 2022. And Corbyn will get in. He has a formidable uh, street fighting machine in momentum. He has people pumped up behind him. And the Conservatives are getting, looking a bit lost and a bit disillusioned. It is not in, at all impossible for Jeremy Corbyn to become the next Prime Minister. And if he does, MacDonald will be right behind him at his left shoulder, with, a, with an agenda, and his agenda includes, above all, the taxation of assets, whether it's the taxation of pension pots, whether it's the taxation of um, property. And if I was you as an industry, I would spend quite a lot of time lobbying, uh, not just the government, but poss- the potential next government, about the effect on pensions of those kind of tax, tax grabs, because I think they're going to come. The Labour Party has promised to reverse a lot of the Tory cuts in the health service, very popular that, in housing, in education and much else. If if they're going to stand by their promises, they have to raise a substantial amount of taxation. They'll have to do that, presumably, at a time when we have left the EU. A lot of people expect 
the moment when we leave the EU to see a certain amount of capital flight from the UK anyway. So the capital is leaving. You get a, a, a hard left socialist Labour Party government moving in. Capital will leave even faster. So they've got to do something about it. They've got to find ways of getting taxation into the Treasury quite quickly. And they're going to look, I would predict, at, at property uh, assets of all kinds. So that's something, I think, to think about as an industry. There's one other thing that I want to raise with you before I ask for questions, and it might seem a little bit airy-fairy. I think it's not at all. It's the thing that we all, uh, on the Andrew Marr show, in the BBC, in politics generally, ought to be talking about rather than Brexit, really. Well, there are two things. One is climate change, but the other one is the future of work, because we do seem to be on the edge of a robotics and AI revolution, which is completely going to transform the future of work and the nature of work. Um, the clever people in both parties are beginning to turn their minds to what this might mean in terms of the social security system, but obviously it has enormous implications for your industry as well. Um, I would propose to you that most people um, over the next 30 or 40 years are going to have multiple jobs, one after another. Um, they're going to have to retrain again and again and again. It's not just drivers who will be put out of jobs by automation. It's going to be many lawyers. It's going to be accountants. It's going to be lots of people in white-collar uh, back offices of uh, companies up and down the country. And the speed with which computers can show that they can do things the rest of us thought only we could do as human beings is going to be astonishing and awe-inspiring. And again, history teaches us that even when a really big uh, technological change arrives and destroys swathes of jobs, new jobs appear to soak up that unemployment. And it may be the case this time, but it's going to be tougher this time because the AI revolution is going to challenge so many different kinds of jobs at the same time, which is why I think people to survive are going to have to retrain, relearn, get a new job. They'll do it for five or six years, perhaps quite well paid. Very, uh, productivity is going to go soaring up through the AI revolution. It'll be great. And then suddenly that job will go or be threatened and they'll have to stop and retrain and start again. So I think the pensions model, which says a pension is something that you accumulate slowly and cautiously year by year during a 40-year career in a particular company. And as a result of that, you can then have your 15 years of happy retirement um, going to the south of France or, or wherever you choose um, afterwards. I think that model is going to be broken quite quickly. And I think the new model is very, very interesting for your industry. I think my children, for instance, will go through not um, 30 or 40 years of, of lifetime employment, but because they will live longer and they will be healthier, they'll probably go through 60 or 70 years of, of working life. But in that 60 or 70 years, there'll be great big gaps where suddenly employment stops, they have to retrain. So they're paid for five years rather well, and then for the next three years, they're not. They're paid for two years very, very well, the next 18 months, they're not, and so on. But I think that's going to be a much more typical pattern of employment for people going forward. And that, of course, means that the idea of a pension becomes entirely different. It becomes what you accumulate during the good year, the, the, the fat years to get you through the lean years throughout your life. And I think reshaping that is going to be one of the great challenges for your industry. On that cheerful note, after uh, an address which I know is full of question marks and exclamation marks and yawning gaps and... Um, pendulous um, threads looking a little bit like hanging ropes, of which I apologise, but it's the world in which I live. Um, let's have some questions on, on, on anything else. Thank you. <laughs> Gen gentleman there. Andrew, I'll, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got loads of questions and many of which I'd love to ask you my, my, myself. And we'll come to it in just yeah. a moment, but I do want to ask you one in which we've had come in in several forms on the app, okay. which is essentially about a second referendum. So, ah. uh, so people are asking you what you think your what do you think the chances are of a second referendum, and uh, what would you expect the question to be? All right. Well, the two things are related. The chances I think are quite low. I think there's going to be an enormous amount of noise about a second referendum. A huge. Uh, demonstration on the streets of London tomorrow. Lots of famous figures, Delia Smith and um, Alistair Cameron, lots of other people there, and a lot of interest in this, and more and more MPs saying this is the only way to break this dreadful political deadlock. The reason I'm sceptical is that somebody has to propose legislation for it to happen in the House of Commons, 
And it's very hard for a backbencher to do that. It might happen. Very, very difficult. Theresa May is not going to do it. Come, I, I don't think she set her, set, set her face against it so strongly. Jeremy Corbyn's not going to do it either. So somebody needs to pick it up who hasn't picked it up yet in a position of real authority in Westminster. There aren't many people, as you may have noticed, in a position of real authority in Westminster. Somebody has to pick it up, and then the legislation has to go through Parliament. The last referendum took 11 months for the legislation to go through the Commons and the Lords. And that was in a situation where both the main parties wanted the referendum and agreed with the referendum, and everybody more or less agreed on the question, which is a very straightforward stay or leave question. This time round, what is the question? Is the question uh, Theresa May's deal of whatever nature she finally gets a deal, if she gets a deal, or no deal? Or is it Theresa May's deal or stay in? Or is it Theresa May's deal or stay in? or no deal, or Canada, or whatever. There are so many permutations that I think trying to design a sensible one-off question is impossible, so it has to be a two-question referendum. Is that two referendums, or is that one referendum with two questions on the ballot? How do you sort that out? It is very, very difficult to do. Finally, just before I... The last referendum divided this country really nastily and badly and deeply, and that division still lasts. You go onto Twitter or Facebook or whatever, and you see the horrible abuse of Remainers, of Leavers, and vice versa. People are really starting to hate each other over the European question in a way that hasn't divided politics in my lifetime before. Uh, one MP lost her life in the last election, Joe Cox, the last referendum, Joe Cox. And I worry that if we have another referendum, it's going to be unbearably nasty. I think the Russian trolls will be trying to stir up the poison on all sides. I think money from abroad will be flooding in. I think it'll be a really, really nasty and grim experience. So whether or not it happens, I don't look forward to it if it does. I rather agree. Thank you. Let's have some questions from the floor. We've got one over here by number one. And if you could say who you are and where you're from, please. Uh, Richard Butcher. So I'm oh, Richard, at I PLSA. Um, Andy, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much. And you're right, there are so many questions to ask there. Uh, let me just return the favour, first of all. You said you had an interest in history. You've written some fantastic books on history. I'd recommend to everybody that they should read them. They are very, very, very easy nice. to read and very, very good books to read. So there are lots and lots of questions that we could ask. Let me just ask one then. Um, you say that Theresa May is hanging by a very, very tenuous thread. Now, I'm an essentially pragmatic person pragmatically, have they actually got time to challenge? I mean, I can't remember how long these things take, but have they got time to challenge her? That's a very good question, if I may say so. Um, but the answer is interesting. The um, committee, 1922 uh, committee, has a set of rules. And that rule book has a strange amount of flexibility for the officers of the committee to change the rules in certain dramatic circumstances. So I'm told by people who may well have aspirations to be our next prime minister, who knows, that you could truncate the entire process of... There's two, there's two processes to choose a new Tory leader. First of all, the MPs select two candidates only in an exhaustive runoff of ballots, so they have two candidates, and then if those two candidates are determined to, to fight it out, that goes to the party in the country, and the party in the country then votes. What they tell me is that they could do the entire MP bit of the process in a week. They would just have vote after vote after vote after vote until they came to two candidates at the end. It would be a sensationally dramatic theatrical experience, but it could be done in a week. And then um, there would be huge pressure with the Brexit negotiations coming towards us for one of those two candidates to drop out and say, listen, in these circumstances, I'd love to be a leader, but in these circumstances, it's got to have to be David or whoever, or Dominic or whoever. Um, and therefore, we have a new leader very, very fast. Um, the, but, but even if that didn't happen, they think they could do the entire balloting of the Tory party membership, and there aren't many Tories left. The Tory party now has a smaller membership than the SNP, so it's not a huge number of people. They could do that again in around a week. So you could, in theory, um, produce a new Conservative leader probably within three weeks of Theresa May standing down. Now, it's a difficult three weeks, but three weeks is only three weeks. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, I must say, speaking with some inside knowledge, you're placing a lot of confidence in the, uh, in the postal system and the Conservative Party's internal administration there capacity. Is that. There now, is let's, that. Uh, let's have a, a question over there by number two, please. Oh, I thought your presentation was really fascinating, but there are two questions you didn't yeah. answer. 
in that. One, who do you think will succeed May as leader of the Tory party? And who will be the next prime minister? Where would you put your money? Sorry, who will replace Theresa May? Yes, yes. okay. okay. Who will be so you're really putting minister. it on the spot here. That's good. Um, I th well, so the obvious answer is, given the nature of her crisis, it has to be somebody with a clearer notion of what choices and what negotiations we make in Brussels. The way the Conservative Party has broken, as it were, over the Brexit argument, I think it's much likelier the next leader will be, a, as it were, a proper Brexiteer than a kind of social democratic, let's stick with the Europe kind of soft Brexiteer, which leaves not that many candidates. The obvious candidate everybody talks about is Boris Johnson. Now, I mean, it's very easy to write off Boris Johnson. I went to the Tory party conference uh, in Birmingham um, a, little, a little while ago, and two things were interesting. One, <coughs> the number of people who queued avidly to hear Boris Johnson. He only appeared for one day. He breezed in and then he breezed out and he made um, a characteristic Boris Johnson kind of tub thumping speech and threw his hair around, threw his tummy around and shouted a lot. And they all loved it. And they all loved it. But if you then went back into the coffee bars and the bar bars and you talked to conservatives around the place, the amount of anger and vituperation and hostility to Boris Johnson at the moment is really quite severe inside the Tory party. Um, my guess is that if Tory MPs made him one of the last two, he would then become Prime Minister and Leader. The reason above all, they may dislike him, they may think he's behaved disgracefully in certain ways, that he wasn't a terribly good Foreign Secretary, but they're much more frightened, and rightly, of Jeremy Corbyn from their point of view. And if they're asking themselves, OK, so who is it in the Tory party who has the star appeal, who can cheer the country up, who can stomp around and take on Jeremy Corbyn and win, then they might well conclude that Boris Johnson is the answer. But it's a very dangerous answer for them because it's very divisive. And there are a lot of Tory MPs I know who would not serve under Boris Johnson, who would not obey the Tory whip under Boris Johnson. You could see a fracturing of the Tory party if he became leader. So it's a very dangerous choice for them to make. And I think probably the safer choice is David Davis. I think he is the likeliest person. He is a Brexiteer, he's a hardcore Brexiteer, but he is relatively liked and trusted by liberal Tories too. He's taken many liberal causes up. He's been very interested in miscarriages of justice and other issues over the years. And there's that old hackneyed phrase that young cardinals vote for old popes. So if you vote for David Davis, he's getting on a bit. He might take the party through to 2022 in the next election, or he might not. He might well give people a commitment. He'd only serve until the Brexit deal was done. So he'd say, I'll only do, I'll only do 18 months, and then allow the, the, the other. Because the, there's a really interesting new generation in the Tory party coming up. Dominic Raab is being talked about a lot at the moment. Tom Tugendhat. Um, there are lots of people who are coming up there. Um, but they are not probably quite ready yet. So I, overall, against the wall, I would say David Davis is my answer. Because it's, a, it's a safer answer in many ways to hold the Tory party together than is Boris Johnson, though it'd be a tougher one in, in an election. David Davis, but only for a relatively short period. And who's going to be the next prime minister? Um, as things stand, Jeremy Corbyn. As things stand, Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, universal credit is an enormous... Um, screw up at the moment. There's an awful lot of people who are going to lose a lot of money, who are going to be really, really angry. There's going to be uh, hard case stories all across the press for a long period of time. Um, the biggest um, foul up that Jeremy Corbyn has made has been the anti his handling of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. And I gave him, I hope, a fairly beastly time for 10 minutes when I interviewed him here in Liverpool. But I, personally, I don't honestly think that there's a lot of cut through to voters around the country. I think they're much more concerned about public services, about the state of roads, schools, local authorities, and the health service. And the promise that Jeremy Corbyn can start to fix that will countermand all the... the, 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 the it'll be a very, very angry election, by the way. Most of the media will go absolutely full scale for Jeremy Corbyn, and they'll try and kick him to pieces. But I think it'll be an interesting test of the power of the old media because I suspect on social media uh, with momentum and you know, Jeremy Corbyn has an army out there which is underestimated characteristically by people like me and by the Westminster bubble. And I think as things stand, the Tories are so badly divided over Brexit with a big problem coming up over universal credit, with Theresa May having said that austerity is over but not being able to actually produce the money to, to, to follow through on that, I think things look very good for Labour at the moment. 
Thank you, Andrew. We are almost out of time. I want to ask you one final, very quick question from the app, and I'm afraid I'll have to ask you I'm for a, a I'm sorry, I've been talking too much. Answer. No, you're, you're here to talk. It's been fantastic. Uh, but the question is, never mind Northern Ireland, what if Scotland seeks to pursue independence and join the EU on the, bad of a, on the back of a bad Brexit deal? OK. In my, in my function this morning to cheer you all up, I think that's quite, I think that's quite likely. Um, <clears throat> I was... <laughs> the the, the, the point, the po the, ju just to, to explain it absolutely, the point about, about the Scottish situation is if the Tories give Northern Ireland a deal, which means that Northern Ireland stays inside, effectively inside the single market and the customs union, uh, Nicola Sturgeon goes, hold on a second, that's what we've been asking for for years. We want to stay inside the customs union and the single market. Why not us? And the government has no real answer to that. And I think that gives them, I think, you know, politicians are lucky or unlucky. And I think Nicola Sturgeon is beginning to look like a very, very lucky politician. She may well have her moment for a second Scottish independence referendum just after a pretty chaotic and bloody looking Brexit, where Westminster is frankly looking a bit disgraced in front of the country, and at a time when um, the Northern Ireland option is perfectly possible, it's very hard to defend that, and finally, at a time when the oil and gas price is beginning to rise, which makes mm. the economics of Scottish independence yep. suddenly look a little bit brighter. So I think it's entirely possible. Fascinating. Well, uh, we do have to close there, unfortunately. But Andrew's going straight to the uh, learning hub downstairs. You'll be able to quiz him a little further there. So please do that. We'll be back here uh, at 11.45 to hear about intergenerational issues with David Willits, uh, Lord Willits. But for now, please join me in thanking Andrew for an absolutely fantastic session. Thank you, Andrew. Really good.